Um, thank you, Alvaro. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about curves of higher genus. Um, and so yesterday we talked about elliptic curves which are um, curves of genus one. And um, if you don't know what genus means, that's fine. Um, we're going to, um, we're going to define it. So um, there was some question on, on Piazza, which is about algebraic geometry background. And that's a totally fair question. And I like struggled a lot with like how much background is required. So um, I've tried, so whatever, I, I've tried to make it like self-contained in that um, algebraic geometry background would be good, but not absolutely necessary to understand some of uh, most of the things in the course. Um, so, and in, in the sense that um, if you, um, I've tried to put some of the background that you need in the exercises, for instance, right? So uh, yesterday we were talking about function fields, right? And with maps of curves, one very important thing that comes up is the corresponding extension of function fields. So I've tried to put some of those in exercises in the um, it, at the end of the lecture notes. Um, for and so if you don't have a background in algebraic geometry, then or, or if you've only seen a little bit of it, then you might find it useful to go through those exercises. Um, there was also a discussion on Piazza, and people suggested reading the first two chapters of Silverman. And honestly, if um, all you get all you do during this entire time is read like two chapters of Silverman. That's a great thing to do. Trust me. Um, uh, so so um, so the other thing that I was planning to do, um, and maybe it will be useful. I don't know. Um, so today, uh, or maybe tomorrow as well. So we'll, we'll see about tomorrow later. But um, today at five thirty p.m. Eastern. Eastern time, I will be in the Blackboard Collaborate room. Um, and I will answer algebraic geometry questions. I'll, I mean, of, your, of course, if you have other questions, I'll also answer those. But uh, you, if you have any questions about like the algebraic geometry background required or any particular function field questions, um, you can, uh, I'll, I'll be here, I'll be there from like 5.30 to 6 at least. Um, and you can come visit the room and ask me any questions you have, right? Okay. So hopefully that's somewhat helpful. Great. So today we're going to talk about curves, right? So general curves. So a curve, so what is a curve? So a curve is um, a variety. So it's defined by equations, right? So it's an algebraic variety. Variety um, of dimension one, right? So this means that locally things look like a line, right? Calculus. Um, so for us, most curves are going to be the following, right? So unless mentioned otherwise, like sometimes I'm going to talk about A1, but um, for us, most curves are going to be smooth, um, subjective, and I'm going to add in some other adjectives. And we won't worry about those adjectives, right? So um, absolutely irreducible, uh, geometrically integral, right? So we're not going to worry about these adjectives right now and what they mean. Um, all you need to think of is that you have a nice curve, right? So most of the things that you want to be true are true, right? So um, uh, you can write down equations for them. So smoothness is something that will um, some, that will be important, and projectiveness is something that will be important, right? So these you don't have to worry. About. So absolutely irreducible basically means that if you base change to the geometry to the uh, to the algebraic closure, then your curve does not look like this, right? So it doesn't look like a bunch of curves put together. Um, and geometrically integral has some other stuff. Anyways, so um, it's projective in that it can be embedded into some projective space, right? Uh, but a lot of the examples that we're going to do are going to be, so our examples are mostly going to be curves in P2, right? Which means they're going to be hom defined by homogeneous polynomials of, of in three variables, right? So x, 
y, z. And then um, we're going to dehomogenize them like we did elliptic curves. And so effectively, you're just going to have um, uh, two variables to work with. Right. So um, let's do some quick examples. The first one is the general class of these curves that I was talking about here. They're called plane curves. Right. So their so plane curve of degree d is defined oops, is defined by a homogeneous polynomial of degree d inside p2. Okay. And um, so what this does, and, and so after dehomogenizing it, what you can what you can think of is just an equation that looks like a i j x to the i y to the j equals zero. And so this is after setting z equal to 1. And remember, yesterday, when we were talking about elliptic curves, we also looked at z equal to 0, right? So let's call this curve c. So you can also, if you set z equal to 0, c intersected with z equal to 0. Right? This is going to give you some, some solutions, which we don't see here. And these are going to be called the points at infinity. Let's look at some other um, plane curves. Um, another class of curves is called are, are called um, hyperelliptic curves. So, this is a generalization of elliptic curves. Right. So these come with a degree two map to P one. And they admit a model. So they admit equation. So as we saw yesterday, equations giving a curve are not unique, right? So you can like make transformations and move around variables. So these admit an equation that looks um, that looks like this, y squared equals fx, where fx is, um, well, we're over fq, so it's a polynomial in fq that is square free. Um, an elliptic curve is a special case where f has degree 3, but in general, these could have higher degrees. And the map to p1, right, so the map to p1 is um, given by sending xy to x1. Okay. So uh, it might be useful for us to dwell on this a little bit and look at what happens to the corresponding extension of function fields. So happens to the function fields. Okay. So what is this induced map? Right? So here, what are we looking at? We're looking at KP1. And we want to look at what it looks like inside KFC. Right? Now, what is KP1? These are functions on P1, right? And uh, you can sort of, if you ignore the point at infinity, what are functions um, of P1? Well, okay, so there's a question um, that says the degree of a map is defined as the degree of the extension of the function field. Yes, that is correct. So the degree here, again, ah, yes. So the degree of the map, this is equal to the degree of the fun extension of function fields. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Great. So this is a quadratic extension of function fields. Okay. So now let's go back to understanding what KP1 is, right? So KP1, well, it's basically a line. So what are functions on a line? They're polynomials, right? So this is just going to be polynomials in one variable. And Kc, well, um, you're going to have Kx. And now, notice what you're doing over here, right, with this equation. What you're doing is you're taking fx and you're adjoining a square root of, the, of fx, right? So K, um, oops, my bad. So Kc 
is kx adjoin the square root of fx. So this is the corresponding extension of function field. And what you should compare it to, you can compare it to um, the corresponding extension Q inside Q square root D, where D is some fundamental discriminant, right? So, um, or some square free integer, whatever, um, okay. And so one thing that you want, might want to understand is over here, well, the primes that divide D are ramified, right? So primes that divide D are ramified. And maybe you want to ask what happens in this extension? Sorry, <laughs> ramified. Um, and so maybe you want to ask what happens in the extension kx embedded inside kx adjoin square root fx. Okay. And so if you um, and so if you maybe go back to commutative algebra, then what are primes inside a field um, or inside a polynomial ring over a field? Well. The primes are the irreducible polynomials, right? So um, here primes correspond to irreducible polynomials. Right? And so, oops. And so the things that will be ramified here will come from the factors of fx. So ramified primes are going to correspond to factors of fx, right? So irreducible factors of fx. Now, um, well, you could try to, so if if you, um, if k is large enough, right, then fx split, right? So what you can think of, so this, so this map c to p1 is ramified at the roots of fx. Okay. So another way of thinking about this pictorially is the following. So if you try to, so this is like, um, another way to draw this is the following. So you, you can think of P, P1 as like being a line and C is some curve and then it's got some points and these are the points, right? So because C is given by Y squared equals FX. In general, if I take a point here, if I take some value of X here, um, the two roots of FX give you these two values of, um, the, two square, the two square roots of FX give you the two values here and here. And the ramified points are where these two roots collapse and give you the same, same point, right? So, um, in terms of the degree, in terms of the extension of function fields, this is the picture you should keep in mind, right? And the ramified points are the points where fx vanishes, right? Or where the roots above the map are, um, the, um, the, the points above the map sort of collapse to give you one point. Okay. Um, so this, so if, if P, so uh, I should say here that this is hyper elliptic if P is an odd prime, right? So if you're over, um, so hyper elliptic. Um, the characteristic is odd. And even characteristic, you, you have some other form. Okay, and the third example, which I'm not going to dwell on too much, but um, so this is what is, so this extension of function fields is tamely ramified. If you've seen a little bit of um, um, algebraic number theory, um, there are wildly ramified extensions of P1 and these are called um, Artin Shire curves. So, Artin Shire curves, which in characteristic P right, um, are given by y to the p minus y equals fx, where um, fx is a rational function. And this happens to be. Uh, a wildly ramified cover of P1. 
the, the map is the same. You send x, y to x. Okay, great. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to divisors on curves um, and points on curves. Um, so before we go on, are there any questions? There is a question in the chat. Is the degree of the map defined as the degree of the extension of the function field? Yeah, I think I answered that. So yeah, so it is. So whenever you have a map of two curves, um, the way you define the degree of this map. So um, so maybe I didn't put this in the notes, but the the degree of of V is defined um, as the degree of this extension of function fields. I'm gonna add it. Thank you. Um, so I should say that here you need a surjective map, right? Um, all our maps are going to be like um, at least so subjective on cube on um, f cube r points, right? So you need to, so technically what this is called in an algebraic geometry is a dominant map, um, right? So but you you for for our purposes you can just think of it as as a surjective map. You don't have to worry about dominant. Um, and so, um, because otherwise, this this induced extension, it doesn't induce. If you don't have a dominant map, then it doesn't induce an injection on the corresponding function fields. So we're going to assume all of our maps do this kind of thing. Awesome. Okay. Great. So now we're going to go on to talking about divisors on curves. Um, let's see. Okay. So C is going to be a curve over FQ for us. A lot of these definitions make sense um, it, over any field, right? So the definition of divisors, degree, et cetera, et cetera, they're going to make sense over any field. But all of the point counts, for instance, like we're going to be interested in counting points on curves. So um, that will only make sense. Um, well, in this case, that will only make sense for for finite fields. Okay, great. So let's say you have a point inside um, inside C of F Q bar, right? We will define the degree of a point, right, to be the the degree of the minimal extension extension. Um, of FQ over which this point is defined, right? Uh, um, P is defined. So, for example, if you have, um, if you have again a hyperelliptic curve in in odd characteristic, right? Um, if you take an X for which FX is not a square, right? So, if you take an so this part, this point x comma square root of fx can be defined over a quadratic extension, right? So if fx is not a square uh, in, in fq, then this is going to be defined as a quadratic over a quadratic extension. And so this point is going to have degree two. Okay. Um, so a quick exercise. So this is marked as exercise two in uh, exercise eight in the in the um, lecture notes. Um, so you a uh, quick exercise is to find the number of degree n points on a one fq. Right. So a one basically just means the affine line. Um, So hint is use exercise seven plus Mobius inversion, which you learned in the last lecture. Right. So Brandon talked about Mobius inversion in his lecture, so you can use that in order to find the degree endpoints on A1. It's quite a fun exercise, actually. Okay, great. 
definition, what is a divisor? A divisor is a zillinear combination of points. Right? So you could write it as a formal sum, NPP, where P is any point on on C, right? So it can it, it can be defined over any field. And we what are the few things we demand? Well, the NPs have to be inside Z, of course. Um, and all but finitely many, you want this to be a finite sum, so all but finitely many are zero. Many NPs. And so just as there's a notion of a, um, um, of a point being defined over a field, there's a notion of a divisor being defined over a field, right? So let's do an example. So um, notice that here, your points can be defined over any field, right? But um, the, so you have a Galois action. So Galois, um, let's call this D. Um, so, and suppose you have sigma inside the Galois group of F Q bar over F Q, then you can construct sigma D by basically applying um, sigma to all of the points, right? So it's some Galois group and you, um, so some element of the Galois group and you just apply sigma to all of the points. <laughs> Excuse me. And D is said to be defined over FQ if sigma D equals D. Okay, okay. so um, here is an example. A favorite example is going to be a hyperolytic curve because it's so easy to work with. Um, and we're going to take D to be the points x square root of x and, sorry, plus x negative square root of x. So now if fx is not a square, okay, then each point is defined over a, over a degree two extension. Each point is quadratic. Right? But d itself, right? So d, however, d is defined over FQ. And the reason for that is that if you take any Galois element, the Galois element will permute these two, right? So it'll switch these two, but the sum still doesn't change, right? So it's still defined, it'll defined over FQ. Awesome. And so there's a notion of the degree of a divisor. Right? This is defined as, well, if so, if, if D is the sum over NPP, then this is just sum over NP, PP. So, um, keep on. so for example, this one, this, this is a degree four rational divisor, FQ rational divisor. When I say rational, I mean defined over the base field. Awesome, great. Okay, what is another way to generate divisors? So let's talk about that. So let's say I have, so examples of divisors. These are important examples of divisors. Um, let's say I have a function, so a rational function on C, right? So if you want, um, you can think of C as being a plane curve in which case f is um, uh, it's a ratio of two polynomials, right, of the same degree. Okay, is there a lag in, in what I'm writing? I feel like there's a lag. Uh, maybe a little bit, can you write something? Hello? Oh, there. I think it's on, it goes, it's on and off. It's fine. 
I think it's okay. Okay. So what you can do is okay. So um there's an echo again. Sorry, my bad. Great. So what you can do with F is take div take something called div F. Which is defined as sorry, it doesn't echo. Can everybody else also hear the echo? There's a little bit, it's not too much. Did you change the did you okay. change what uh where the microphone is? All right. No, not better. How about now? That's better. No, no, you're good. Really? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. Oh, wait. Sorry, give me a second. My bad. Okay, oh, yeah, definitely better. Now there is a, okay. Ah! Okay, how is this? Okay, how is this? Nope, not good. Okay, I'm just gonna do this. It works. Okay, hopefully this works. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. Okay. Oof, technology. Sorry. Um <laughs> So um, the way you construct the divisor is you take um, the order of um, the, the, the function at p and then multiply it by p, right? So what this means, so what does order mean, right? So if, if ord p, so if f has a zero, right? So if f has a zero at p, then this is the order of vanishing. The order of vanishing. Right? Um, and if F has a pole, right, then um, it's negative of the order of the pole. So div f has some positive things and some negative things. And um, the positive things come from the zeros of f and the negative things come, come from the poles of f, right? So um, I think I have time to do a quick example. Um, so, so if you look at um, y squared equals x cubed, um, or let's see it, let, let's look at an elliptic curve, which I'm gonna write this way. And I'm going to consider the rational function x, right? So x is a you can think of as a function in this because it, it's an element of sorry, the fraction field of kxy adjoin y squared minus fx, right? Where fx is this whole function. Ooh, apology of x. Okay, so f is going to be this function x. Um, now, where does x have zeros, right? So if you write this as x cubed plus ax plus b, right? Um, then x has zeros um, when y is like plus or minus square root b, right? So x has two zeros, p1 and p2, right? Um, 
and um, right. So if it's uh, if the if the two points are the same, then I'm going to count them with multiplicity, right? And if x and the question is where does x have poles? So remember that little x was capital X over capital Z, right? From before we had like this is like because this equation is the dehomogenized version of something that was um, um, uh, that was in projective space, right? We'd like said we divided out by z, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so this you can show that it actually has two pole has a pole of order two of order two at infinity, right? So, um, infinity is a point where z is zero, right? And so you can show that this this um, this function actually has um, a pole of order two at infinity, right? The, the order two I'm gonna leave as an exercise. Okay. Um, great. So the divisor corresponding to x is p1 plus p2 minus twice infinity. Awesome, great. So here are some exercises. Um, oh wait, no, it's fine. Okay, so first one. So I'm going to define div zero as the set of divisors of degree zero. Right, um, and you can see that this actually um, forms a subgroup. Um, Somia, yeah. mm -hmm. there's a question. Um, is f equals x different from the variable x that is used to define the elliptic curve? No, it's the same. The same? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That is crucial. So you can think of x as being a function on, on, the, elliptic uh, on, on the elliptic curve by thinking of it as an element of this, this field. So kxy mod y squared minus g of x, right? That's the ring of functions on on um, um on e. Great. Good question. Okay. So div zero forms a subgroup of div c, and div c is basically the set of all divisors. All divisors, right? Um, and because I'm defining them as a formal linear combination, you can always like add and subtract these. And div zero is a subgroup of these, and they're like the ones that have degree zero. The second one, right? This requires you um, using that C is projective, right? That um, if um, if D is a principal divisor, um, sorry, if, if D comes from a rational function, we're going to call this. Um, principal divisor then degree of d is zero right and so you can show that print print c okay so print c there so this exercise would show the print c which is the set of all um principal divisors right things coming from rational functions that this is a subgroup of the set of of the set of degree zero divisors. Okay. Awesome. And so now is the big definition, which is the first one called the Picard group of C. This is defined as the set of all divisors on C, modulo the ones coming from the principal divisors, right? So you quotient out by the set of principal divisors. And the second is um, pick zero of C, which is also called the Jacobian of C. This is defined as the set of degree zero divisors 
quotient allowed by the principal divisors. Right. So this is like the big definition, that the most important definition from this section, right? Knowing what big zero is. questions about this so far? Okay, um, so if you want, what you can do, so here are um, some examples of what big zero looks like. So in, in, okay, so if you look at the Picard group of C, right, this is all the divisors mod the principal divisors. There is a map from this to Z that sends D to the degree of D. And it turns out there's actually an exact sequence. It's not very hard to prove, right? The ones that the kernel of this map is just the um, degree zero divisor, right? Um, <laughs> excuse me. And so, there are some things that you can do, right? So again, this does not require much background in algebraic geometry, just an understanding of what P1 means, right? So um, so P1, um, you can show that also pick a P1 is actually isomorphic to Z, right? A divisor is, is so, every, so this would work. Um, you can show this by showing that every degree um, zero divisor, right, is actually principal. Um, the second one, so this is actually in the exercises and but sort of like walks you through how to do this problem, is that the uh, Jacobian of E is isomorphic to E, where E is an elliptic curve. Um, so this is actually a very, very cool thing um, and also a very important um, isomorphism that like comes up a lot when you're talking about elliptic curves. Um, I won't talk about, uh, about this much right now because of the lack of time, but the notes and the exercises explain it a little more, right? So they give you a map from E to pick not of E and then um, and explain that better. So um, I should say that sometimes I'm going to, so pick not of E of, of any C, I'm gonna sometimes denote it by the Jacobian of C, right? Um, so the same, same thing, right? So this is just notation. Awesome. So now we're ready to define genus. Let's see how much I can do. So let's define the genus of it first. Sumit? Yes. There's a question. Uh, can you explain why is uh, the print uh, C a subset of divisor, the zero divisors? So why the... Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I left this as an exercise, but the way to think about this is the following. So. Um, if you look at a projective curve, so for instance, you can just, um, um, you can think of the curve as being a, a, a curve in the plane, for instance, right? You, you, if you want, you can just work with one homogeneous polynomial in three degrees, sorry, in, um, in three variables. Um, and then what happens is these rational functions are defined as the ratio of two polynomials. They're G over H. And because you're on projective space, um, these have to have the same degree. So projective space implies that degree of G has to be equal to the degree of H. And so the number of zeros, which are gonna come from the zeros of G are gonna be the same as the no number of poles. Right. So, um, because in projective space, remember you can scale variables and you should still get the same answer. So if you scale variables, if you're, so both of these have to be homogeneous and in particular, they have to be homogeneous at the same degree, otherwise this won't be well-defined. Good question. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so, okay, 
Okay, maybe I have a time I have time for a quick aside. So if you have a curve over C, right? Um over C. <laughs> um so what is a curve over C? Well, it's a dimension one object over C, right? So um what this looks like is a Riemann surface. Right. Um, so if you've seen some complex analysis, maybe you've seen a Riemann surface before, but if not, what this looks like is, is a glorified torus. Right. And the genus of the curve is just defined to be the number of holes. And um, if you've seen some topology, then it turns out that like the homology of this curve is, is, is sort of generated by two G generators, right? So I'm going to call this G, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, while this picture doesn't make sense over FQ, there is, um, there is a notion of like homology and cohomology even in finite fields. And it turns out that the cohomology of a curve uh, the, the, uh, the corresponding cohomology of a curve also has two G generators. So th this picture, even though it doesn't make sense over um, finite fields, it's very closely related to what happens over finite fields, right? Um, so if you want to take the equations of a curve, and just think of it in terms of the, uh, the um, a curve over C and then count the number of holes, you would be okay. So don't, would be okay. Anyway, enough philosophizing. Let's actually define genus. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the set of differentials on a curve. And what this is, is um, <laughs> um, this is kind of the set of differentials from calculus, right? So you have a bunch of equations in X and Y, and then you want to take dx, dy, df, where f is some function on, on the curve, right? So let's say C is your curve, and you want to take some, um, if you take f, which is some function on the curve, then uh, the set of differentials, or differential is, a KC linear combination of such DFs, right? So it's like, um, right? So, so you can think of it as like a formal sum of DFs, so like DF plus DG, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and subject to the following conditions, first of all, you want it to be linear, so D of F plus G is DF plus DG. Um, you want it to kill constants, right? So D of a constant function should be zero. And most importantly, it should satisfy the Leibniz rule, which is D of FG, which is the product rule that you may have seen in calculus. So it's GDF plus FDG. Right? So, so what this is, so, so, this is called the Leibniz rule. Right? So differential right, is just going to be a combination of these. So some F, Fi, Dgi, right? Subject to all of these relations. Great. Um, so there is a way, so talk about um, zeros and poles of a differential. And if I have time at the end of this, um, I'll talk about how um, how you define these. Um, and so, so because you could define zeros and poles, you can define the divisor of omega. So can define by a divisor of omega. So if omega has no poles, 
then it's called holomorphic. So this is very much analogous to the holomorphic functions um, or holomorphic differentials from complex geometry, right? So um, if it has no poles, then it's called holomorphic. And what you what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect only the holomorphic differential. So uh, capital omega of C is going to de denote the set of holomorphic differentials on C. Right. So, um, so what this is, and so this turns out to be a vector space. G is defined to be the dimension of this vector space. Awesome. Great. Um, <laughs> Hopefully, so intuitively, I don't know. I don't know if this is, I don't know if you see for, see this for the first time, what you think of this definition or what kind of intuition it gives you. But the handle picture is the intuition you should have behind it. Um, but um, this is how it's defined. It's the dimension of the vector space. So um, for example, right, you can show that E Let's do a quick, um, right, so first of all, I want to define uh, the divisors. So so I, I promise you that um, it makes sense to talk about poles and zeros of a, of a um, differential, right? So let's see what that means. So if you have omega, which is some differential on a curve, Um, so locally, so I'm going to write a div omega tautologically as or d e omega d. E, right? So the question is, what do I mean by the order of, of, of a differential at a point? Right? That's the question. Um, and so what you can do for a curve is that locally you can write curve in one variable. So this is like, this is very much analogous to like the in, inverse function theorem in um, in calculus, right? So, or when you try to like parameterize a curve in calculus, like locally, you can write things in one as one variable, right? So locally around P, you can write C in terms of one variable. Right. And let's say we call that variable T. So that means that the differential, right, which is the linear combination of all of these functions and DGs, where DG is also a function, you can write omega as some f of t dt. Right. And so the order of of omega at that point is just defined as the order of this function at this at this point, right? So f of t is something, it's got some zeros and poles, right? So order at t order at t equal to zero of f of t. Okay, so I'm out of time, but maybe I'll say one quick thing. So so Maybe an example will make this slightly better. Um, so if you write y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, right? And remember, x was a function, right? So we can take omega to be dx. And um, you want to calculate the zeros and poles of omega, right? So um, let's say you're around the point. Um, so let's say x minus e1, x minus e2, minus e3. So let's say you want to look at the point E1, 0. So P1 equals E1, 0. And at this point, what happens is, um, right, so E1 is somewhere here. It turns out that this local variable in terms of which you can write everything is Y. So you can write, um, 
So y is the local variable. Right? You can prove this using the inverse function theorem if you like. Um, is the local variable, which means that, um, so you can write um, x minus e1 as y squared times some other, something that's a unit in the local local ring at that point, right? So the unit basically means you don't have to worry about it. It's about, it, its order is zero. So, um, so that means that dx is 2y times some times the unit plus y squared times the, the derivative of the, the unit, blah, 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 which means that the order of that, uh, at this point, e1 of dx um, is the same as the order of y at that point, right? And so y is a local variable, so that's just um, one. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. Um, this, this example is fleshed out more completely in the notes, so you can look at that. Right? So, um, yeah, and, and I think I'll stop there. And tomorrow we'll discuss more things about the Jacobian, et cetera, et cetera.